The New Testament exceeds the evil of the old one is yes. the title of one of your chapters. Yes. Um, that's actually a very easy proposition to prove, I think, in the Old Testament. There's a lot of horror, as everybody knows. Enough horror, actually, that some early Christians thought of founding their religion without the Old Testament. Why don't we just start a new one and leave these terrible old books behind? Marcion, among the early Christian theologians, took that view. But they're stuck with it because they have to say that Jesus fulfilled prophecies from the Old Testament. So they, they have to wrap it around their neck. And as you know, it's full of murder, slaughter, torture, genocide, um, gentle mutilation, uh, massacre, cruelty, and so forth. But there's no hell in the Old Testament. There's no talk about punishing the dead. Not in any canonical accepted New Test Old Testament book there isn't. When, when you've been killed and all your people killed with you and your wives and children sold into slavery and uh, your land taken and all of this, um, the jealous God is done with you. you you're not going to suffer anymore. It's not until Jesus says, depart from me into eternal fire. The, the hideous, really obscene idea that is also uh, adopted very strongly by Islam of torturing the dead forever um, is introduced. So, so the New Testament is commonly thought of as meeker and milder than the old, but it's not. It's much nastier. Honor thy father and thy mother. Now, this is another one of the nice ones, right? Unless you compare it to the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus says, do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I come not to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And if you think that's out of context or uncharacteristic of the man Jesus, check out the Gospel of Luke 14.26. Whoever comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother and his brothers and his sisters and his wife and his children and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I think it's funny that so many Christian organizations describe themselves as being family oriented when it's so obvious that Jesus was clearly not. Of course, 1 John 3.15 says, Anyone who hates his, mother, his, hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Revelations 21.8 says, But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. Remember that, Ray Comfort. Their part will be in the, fire, in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So Jesus says to love the Jews, all, love other Jews as yourself. But he also says you're supposed to hate yourself and your brother. And anybody who hates his brother is a murderer who's going to die in the lake of fire. And you have to pick up your cross to follow Jesus, and you will not get eternal life regardless of what Jesus said elsewhere. <laughs> so if it seems... That this is another one of those hundreds of nonsensical contradictions found throughout the Bible. Just remember what your pastors told you. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. So this is not a contradiction. This is not a contradiction. <laughs> Getting back to the topic, we haven't read the whole commandment. It goes on to say, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God give it thee. And now let's forget for a moment that according to this story, and it is just a story, even rabbinical scholars now admit that the Exodus was not an actual historic event. Let's forget that God's, God promised to his chosen people land that already belonged to someone else. Uh, both the Jewish and Christian versions of God are apparently ethnocentric racists. Jesus himself was Jewish, and he denied his lessons and his blessings to those of other races who he criticized, comparing them to dogs. Much the same with his alleged father, Jehovah, who sent an angel into the promised land to drive out a half a dozen tribes who already lived there in favor of his chosen people. This commandment could be read as, honor your father and thy mother so that you will live a long life. Because remember, this was a culture that permitted parents to murder disobedient children. So you'd better show some respect, because it was legal 
for fathers to say, I brought you into this world. I'll take you out. Make another one look just like you. I do spend probably a little bit more time than I should on, on religion, and uh, I have a certain amount of hostility to, uh, to it. Uh, I think the most rational reason for it is because of the harm that I see it does. We were talking about that earlier. Uh, many people do simply awful things out of sincere religious belief, not using religion as a cover, uh, the way Saddam Hussein may have done, but really because they believe that this is what God wants them to do. Going all the way back to Abraham being willing to sacrifice Isaac because God told him to do that. Putting God ahead of humanity is a terrible thing. Consider the second commandment. Thou shalt not erect any graven images. Is this really the second most important thing <laughs> upon which to admonish all future generations of human beings? I mean, is, this, is this as good as it gets, ethically and spiritually? I mean, you remember the Muslims who rioted by the hundreds of thousands over cartoons. What got them so riled up? Well, this is it, the second commandment. Now, was all that pious mayhem, the burning of embassies, the killing of nuns, was all of that some kind of great flowering of, of spiritual and ethical intelligence? Or was it egregious medieval stupidity? Well, come to think of it, it was egregious medieval stupidity. <laughs> the truth is that almost any precept we would put in place of the Second Commandment would improve the wisdom of the Bible. How about don't mistreat children? How about don't pretend to know things you do not know? Or what about just try not to deep fry all of your food? <laughs> could, could we live with the resulting proliferation of graven images? I think we would manage somehow. Mind up now? Yes, I can. Um, dilute, I can, yes, uh, and will. Um, shall, shall in fact. Sexual repression doesn't lead to peace. The idea that women are inferior to men is a profound cause of unease, let's say, the least of it. Um, all religions make some form of this claim. Islam seems to make it less apologetically than most. Uh, claims that the world will come to an end in an apocalyptic form, which will lead to the victory of one religion or another, are not peaceful either. Uh, it's possible, perhaps, I haven't exhausted all my remarks, that the endless teaching of battle stories to children and, le and the stories of lethal feuds from 7th century Arabia don't lead to peace, or the forcing of children to memorize and retell such stories by rote doesn't lead to peace either. Ah, it's arguable that peace isn't attainable at all. Uh, it may be arguable in some forms, that, uh, and sometimes in places that religion isn't even desirable, but it will not come by the fanatical adoption of a man-made text and a man-made supreme leader. Nothing but war and tyranny has ever come from the adoption of formulae like these. The only way to moral and intellectual satisfaction, even temporary, perhaps only temporary, but of any kind at all, is, comes to those who are willing to take the great risk of thinking for themselves at all hazards and of trying to share the benefits of that tolerance and that open-mindedness with others. And with that, for now, I, I'll rest my case. Thank you very much. These professional apologists that I debate, they're engaged in a deceptive, self-congratulatory circle jerk of how smart they are and how they are the experts. And so they're talking to each other and they're going out and trying to argue against atheists and they're not making any headway they're presenting the same arguments over and over. Oh, let me take this argument back and polish it up. Look, it's a new version of the same crap. I removed the obvious flaw that you found. Please find my next flaw. Maybe someday in my attempts to confirm my positions, I will finally have an argument that does so. And they never say, hang on, this isn't why I believe.
The reasons that I believe have nothing to do with tag, have nothing to do with the modologic version of the ontological argument. And they are not adequately engaging with the people in the pews, even at a conference where they are supposed to be there to teach them how to better defend what they believe. They are failing. And I'm fucking thrilled to watch it happen. Because while they're sitting around congratulating each other, I'm talking to the people in the pews, and church attendance is dropping, and one of the fastest growing religious identifications are the nuns, the NONEs, those of us who don't ascribe to any religion. And for those of us who are convinced that reason will eventually win out, we every single day get confirmation of this as church attendance drops, as conferences like this grow, and as apologists sit around going, wow, how'd this happen? The one thing that the Bible isn't, that some people seem to think it is, it's not a biology textbook, it's not an astronomy textbook. The first, the first chapter of Genesis, the first couple of chapters of Genesis are uh, the 6th century BC version of how the world might have started. We've improved on that since. I don't believe that those are God's words. Those are the words of men trying to make the most sense that they could out of out of the information they had at the time. You don't buy Adam and Eve either. No, I don't buy Adam and Eve either. Uh, but uh, it's undoubtedly a legend which has some significance, but it's not historical. What about the life of Christ? Well, Jesus. Well, this of course is in historic times. It's at the time when the when the uh, Roman Empire was at its height. And the thing about it is that all the only information we have about the life of of Jesus is in the Gospels, in the New Testament Gospels. There's no reference to him in any literature outside. There's one dubious paragraph in the histories of Josephus, which may have is that been... right? There's no reference to Jesus other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? And, of course, in, in, in the rest of the Bible, the, 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 epistle, yeah, right. the epistles of Paul, Acts of the Apostles. Right, right, right. But outside the sacred writings, absolutely no mention. No historian who was not... Who, who is not... Who is not a Christian, let's yeah. put it that way. Not in Bethlehem, no one left any writings of any kind. None, none. This doesn't mean that he didn't exist. The chances are he did. There were many people at the time who were, what should we say, messianic, mm -hmm. uh, who were believed to be messiahs by one group or another. And uh, Jesus survived in the, as a messiah. Incredible impact for someone who got such little notice at the time from historians, right? No, that's true, but uh, that's, the way, that's the way sometimes it works out. Uh, when, when Mohammed also received little notice outside of Arabia, and uh, I dare say many founders of great religions were dismissed by people of the time, except those who believed in them as just one more kook. We've all assimilated this idea that we should respect other people's religious beliefs. Your neighbor has the right to believe whatever he wants to about God and the moral structure to this universe. He has the right to believe whatever he wants to about what happens after death. And you should respect these beliefs merely because he believes them. Where else in our discourse do we play by these rules? Well, when was the last time anyone in this room was admonished to respect another person's beliefs about history? or geography, or engineering, or medicine. We, we do not respect people's beliefs. We evaluate their reasons. If, if my reasons are good, are good enough, you will helplessly believe what I believe. That is what it is to be a rational human being. Reasons are contagious. If I came on the stage and said that the Holocaust never happened, you would be under no burden whatsoever to respect my beliefs. And we don't respect the beliefs of people who think Elvis is still alive, I and mean, the people who make all those crazy pilgrimages to Graceland. I mean, these people do not get invited to sit on our boards of directors. They don't become presidents of universities. I mean, that, that, is, that, that is all well and good, except when you change the, the, the subject to God, and then all bets are off. Then the sky's the limit. You can be certain with zero evidence, and and respected for it. It is taboo to push the, push the conversation 
into criticism of your beliefs. So um, what I'm advocating, really, and what I advocate in my book is a kind of conversational intolerance. I, I, this, we don't need new laws. We don't have laws against Holocaust deniers. You know, that you, all we need is a, a standard of intellectual honesty where people who pretend to be certain about things they're clearly not certain about receive some conversational pressure. I mean, the, this would all be accomplished if we, if we treated everyone who spoke about God on the floor of the Senate as though they had just spoke about Poseidon. I mean, just imagine. Imagine, you know, we have all these hurricanes in the Gulf and some senator gets it into his head that we should really be praying to Poseidon. I mean, this, after all, is his jurisdiction. This is... The ocean is reclaiming our cities. It, clearly, that would be the end of that person's political career. And it, yet it's not like someone discovered in the third century that the biblical God exists, but Poseidon doesn't. I mean, the, these claims have exactly the same status. We are physical beings in a physical universe that follows physical laws. There are truths to be discovered about how our actions benefit us and how our actions harm us. This is simply true. We don't need another mind. This is about the interaction of minds, but we don't need some transcendent mind to dictate what is true, we discover what is true about the reality that we inhabit. God or not, soul or not, we can choose everything on the list that Cliff just talked about, about being good to each other and building a productive society and caring and loving and trying to end poverty, trying to end oppression, and trying to build a better society. We can do all of that just because it's the right thing to do. There's no evidence for a soul. In fact, there's good evidence against it. There's no evidence, or not enough evidence, um, of the various God claims that are out there, or not any particularly good evidence, at least that I've been made aware of. But I could be wrong. And tomorrow, I could find out that there is a God, and that I do have a soul. And it wouldn't change very much for me as far as how I end up living my life, because I've already come to good, good reasons to do things. Now, I'm open to being corrected on them, but what's going to correct me is reason and evidence not appealing to a God. And if people have asked me, well, what are you going to do if you die and you end up standing before God? Hey, I tried. I used my brain. I followed the evidence where it was. And by the way, if your character is actually accurately depicted in the Bible or the Quran, I don't want nothing to do with you. I'm already morally superior to you. I already care more about people than you do. I know. I've never sanctioned slavery, never sanctioned genocide. Gods have. Nor can we cope with the behavior of objects that move at some appreciable fraction of the speed of light. Common sense lets us down because common sense evolved in a world where nothing moves very fast and nothing is very small or very large. The mundane world of the familiar, which I have dubbed middle world. At the end of a famous essay on possible worlds, the great biologist J.B.S. Haldane wrote, Now my own suspicion is that the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. I suspect that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of or can be dreamed of in any philosophy. How should we interpret Haldane's queerer than we can suppose? Queerer than can, in principle, be supposed, or just queerer than we can suppose, given the limitation of our brain's evolutionary apprenticeship in middle world. Could we, by training and practice, emancipate ourselves from middle world, tear off our black burqa, and achieve some sort of intuitive, as well as just mathematical, understanding of the very small, the very large, and the very fast? I genuinely don't know the answer. But I'm thrilled to be alive 